Hello, welcome to RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. My name is Professor Tracy Robson and we're here today to discuss living well through the perimenopause and menopause. This forms part of RCSI's My Health series. I'd like to thank the RCSI Women's Network and the RCSI My Health series team for working collaboratively together to bring this event to us today. The series explores a wide range of health and well-being issues and brings together a panel of leading experts in the health area to help you as individuals make informed decisions on your own health and well-being. Today I am joined by Dr Kiva Hartley, GP at Menopause Health and GP Tutor at RCSI Medicine and Health Sciences, Dr Maria Pertle, Lecturer, Division of Population Health Sciences, Department of Psychology, RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, and Maeve Whelan, RCSI alumnus and practice associate at Milltown Physiotherapy and specialist in women's health physiotherapy. Welcome to RCSI My Health Series. Thank you to all of you who submitted questions for today's event. We received close to 200 questions and we tried to group as many of them together into key themes to address all of your questions. And our speakers will also share individual uh, resources and links on our website. So Kiva, what are some of the most common symptoms and lesser known symptoms perhaps of the perimenopause and menopause? Thank you, Tracy. A great question and a great place to start. Um, but where do I start? Because it's so broad. So um, what's interesting, I suppose, about perimenopause and menopause is that, uh, um, first of all, it's very individual. Um, and um, we, we basically, we have estrogen and progesterone and testosterone receptors throughout our bodies. Um, but in particular, we've estrogen receptors really from head to toe. And it is the loss of this hormone estrogen through menopause that makes us symptomatic. Um, so because of that, I suppose we see symptoms that are just totally varied from person to person. We can group them into um, mood and emotional symptoms, um, things like anxiety, irritability, um, low mood. They're quite common through menopause. Um, for other women, they might get more physical symptoms. I think everyone is probably familiar with hot flushes and night sweats, um, and they're extremely common um, and would affect about 70 or 80 percent of women going through menopause, although it's a spectrum and, and some people get worse hot flushes than others. Um, and, you know, the joints can be affected. We see um, generalized joint aches and pains, a change in skin, a change in hair. Uh, we can see digestive issues, palpitations can be common. Um, it all sounds a bit frightening, I think, when you start to lay it all out. But, um, and the other one not to ignore would be genit what are called genitourinary symptoms of menopause. So uh, these would be things like vaginal dryness and painful sex and urinary symptoms like needing to pee a lot or frequent UTI. So basically, unfortunately, head to toe. And how long do these symptoms last? So that depends. And again, I suppose really individual and really depends on the person. Some women have no symptoms. Their periods stop, they feel fine and life continues on. They may get changes to their bone density and to their heart health. And we know that that you know, is happening in the background. But from a symptomatic point of view, they might be OK. But for a good 70 or 80 percent of women, they are symptomatic. Things like hot flushes, night sweats, they're called vasomotor symptoms and they can persist for an average about five to seven years, which is probably longer than I think most people realise. Um, cognitive function can be affected um, and that too can last for five to seven years or longer for some women. It just, it really depends on the person. So hugely individual and lots of variation. And what's the difference between perimenopause and many menopause and you know how do we test for that sort of diagnostically and you know what do we mean by hormone testing? Yeah so perimenopause um, is I suppose it's terminology uh, terminology really at the end of the day so perimenopause is just the terminology that we're given to the changes that happen to our ovaries so your ovaries produce follicles at the start of your cycle and uh, ultimately they contain oocytes or eggs and ultimately one of those will become the egg that you ovulate and those follicles they produce our estrogen and as we age our ovaries have fewer follicles and therefore we start to produce smaller amounts of estrogen but early on in this process your brain and body are trying to correct what's happening in your ovaries and so they start stimulating your ovaries and you actually start it's like you're losing control of a car you get times of producing too much estrogen and times of producing too little 
And so the range of oestrogen, of this hormone called oestrogen during the month starts to vary wildly. And that fluctuation, that variability is what causes a lot of perimenopausal symptoms. So a perimenopausal woman will still be having periods, although she might notice a change in how regular they are. Her cycle may be longer, it may be shorter, her periods might be getting heavier, but it's reflecting hormonal change and a, pr and a change in the production of these hormones from her ovaries. And in terms of testing for perimenopause, we can't. So blood tests can be useful, especially in women under 45, um, to confirm perhaps that they've had a change in these hormones, but in reality, it's very difficult to test a moving target and that's what's happening. So you're testing something that's fluctuating. So we rely on our history taking on um, the symptoms that someone is providing um, or discussing and we use that really as a kind of marker for what's happening. Um, perimenopausal women, they still have periods, as I say, they can be irregular, that's really the key feature. And then we look at the symptoms that they're having. Whereas with menopause, the word menopause just means your final menstrual period, that's all it means. And really until you've gone 12 fun months with no period, you don't know that that was your last period. So again, it's really a clinical diagnosis and blood tests are not usually indicated with the exception of maybe just ruling out other things that might be contributing. So checking thyroid hormones, et cetera, that kind of thing. That's great, Kiva. And in terms of the long-term implications, health implications for women, what are those? And I guess it's, this is particularly relevant to women who undergo early menopause. Yeah, so early menopause would be menopause happening under the age of 45. So this is basically a loss of ovarian function or ovarian production of hormones like oestrogen under the age of 45. That's about 5% of women. Premature menopause happens about 1% of the female population and that's defined as menopause happening under the age of 40. Um, but for all women whose periods stop, with that loss of oestrogen, we see a huge change in bone density. So that would be one of the big um, long-term health outcomes that we pay attention to. And bone density is really important to protect you from developing fractures for, um, I mean, other things happen with the loss of bone density. You can get chronic pain um, and a loss of your mobility. Uh, so there's a huge knock on implications to losing bone density. And it's a risk factor for developing osteoporosis, which a lot of people might have heard of. Um, so uh, we see this loss of bone density happen at a rate of about 2% per year in that first five years after your period stop. But if you are, if you're 40 when your period stop, you have an extra 10 years. The average age of menopause is about 50, 51. If your periods stop at 40, that process of bone density loss just begins much earlier in your life. And you are therefore at much increased risk of having osteoporosis and thinning bones. Um, the other, I suppose, big long-term health outcome that we would see change would be cardiovascular disease. Your blood vessels and your heart, they need oestrogen to stay healthy. And we know oestrogen really helps keep our blood vessels flexible and stop them from becoming rigid and, and, um, and allow them to kind of uh, adapt a little. With that loss of oestrogen, we see plaque buildup starting to form. We see maybe um, things like high blood pressure starting to happen. And again, if you're 40 when you, your period stop or if you're younger, um, this process just starts that bit earlier. And so we're quicker to intervene. And the last thing would just be cognitive function. Um, and there's only emerging research. We don't have enough data really on this yet, but there is a question mark over potentially the loss of oestrogen and the development of things like dementia and the loss of cognitive function too. That's great. So, so when should a woman really go to see their GP or doctor? You know, how, how bad do the symptoms need to be? Well, that's hard to define. I mean, how do you tell someone, you know, you have to wait until you're really bad? Or I think if you have symptoms that are impacting your quality of life, they're affecting you from just enjoying things on a day to day basis, even if it's if it's having an impact on your relationship, your ability to work, but just your enjoyment of your life. Or if you have concerns, then I think that's a really good reason to maybe make an appointment and speak to someone about about these symptoms or concerns that you have. Mm. So Maria, what are some of the psychological symptoms of the menopause? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that the physical symptoms and the psychological symptoms of the menopause are very intertwined. Um, even um, without the menopause, the physical and psychological symptoms are always intertwined. So um, when we experience physical symptoms, it can affect how we feel. And some of the physical symptoms associated with the menopause can be distressing for women, and they can be unpleasant. So that affects how we feel um, within ourselves. It's also, um, I suppose, in terms of the symptoms that people experience most, 
things um, that Quiva mentioned as well, like low mood or increased anxiety would be very common. But it's really important to flag that um, the level at which people experience those um, wouldn't be at um, the same, wouldn't meet a clinical diagnosis as such. They're essentially very normal reactions to a really important transition in a woman's life. It's also really important to flag that or to appreciate um, feelings of grief that can all often accompany the menopause as well. So people can have feelings of grief um, in relation to um, no longer being a, a younger woman, um, the loss of fertility, for example, um, even the, lo the loss of periods, um, and um, possibly not feeling as sexually active as they would have been previously. So. All of that can wear away at our sense of self and really affect how we feel and of course contribute to low mood and um, anxiety or worry as well. In terms of the menopause, change is obviously individual for, for everyone and I'm hearing that people will have different symptoms and experience different things. So how can we learn to deal with those changes as individuals? Yeah. I suppose, you know, e even the term, the change, is, is quite a negative term and it became kind of scary, I suppose. Um, so I think the first thing to say um, is that we should try and reframe it as a really normal, healthy transition in a woman's life. Um, so it isn't anything atypical. Um, and, you know, it's something that roughly 50% of the people living in the world will experience at some point. Um, but saying that, it is a subjective experience. So no two people are going to experience it exactly the same way. Um, so, so it's important to flag that. Um, I suppose, um, I think one of the key things is to try and recognise when we have these, have these symptoms. And I try and um, to almost chart um, chart the symptoms and our, our and the mood triggers so what situations um, what are the situations where we are particularly vulnerable to experiencing low mood or anxieties so if we can recognize those then we're able to manage those better as well so um, we can put supports in place um, in order to um, you know, social supports possibly are seeking help from um, healthcare professionals going to your GP and talking about them. So, so that's really, really important. So I suppose the first piece of advice would be to be open about it, talk to other people, um, talk to your friends and family, to other women who are um, at a similar stage in life and share your experiences because other people are going through the same things. Their experiences may not be exactly the same as yours. No two people experience it the same way, but um, you're not alone in, um, you know, in having concerns about it and experiencing those changes. And, you know, talking is therapy and they're, you know, sharing your experiences um, has a therapeutic effect. So it's really helpful to do that. Um, the second thing I would say is to also find something that you enjoy doing and use that to manage your symptoms. So a lot of people use maybe yoga or mindfulness, but that really isn't for everyone. So find something that works for you. It could be going out into nature, doing uh, physical exercise of some kind, um, talking, meeting with your friends, creative pursuits, or just even reading a, a good book, for example. So just something, um, something that works for you and listen to your body, know your body, um, see what it needs and respond to that. So it's, it's really important um, to be self-aware and to watch the, the self-talk as well. So we can be very critical of ourselves and, you know, think, you know, why am I coping with this? Why am I able to, to manage this when other people seem to be? But, you know, self-compassion is so important um, and it is a big transition. Um, so it's important to be mindful of that and to be kind to yourself. And, you know, for some people, they find that they're not comfortable opening up about the symptoms. And if you feel that there is no one that you're comfortable with talking, um, talking to about this, then, you know, there are low cost counselling options available and to just try and find that kind of safe space where you can talk about these things confidentially and voice your concerns because talking about it is really, really helpful. 
That's great, Maria. Lovely. So moving on to, to, to Maeve then. So exercise, we know, plays a significant uh, role when we talk to anyone about the menopause. So why is maintaining strength and flexibility so important and what exercise regimen would you prescribe, if you like, for right. a menopausal woman? So you really need to take off with your exercise once you start heading into the menopausal years for lots of reasons. Irritability, sleep, arthralgia and uh, weight gain as one of the really big ones that um, means um, so much to, to every woman going into the menopause. And the other level of exercise that we need to is really important for, and again, Creva said this already, for heart disease, for protection of bone health and uh, prevention of diabetes and, uh, and some of the cancers. So these are all of the reasons that we do exercise. Um, and what I'm hoping to get to talking about exercise is how much and how many and how often and what exactly we do. So a lot of people coming up to the menopause just mightn't be exercising enough and you just simply have to go for it as you come into the menopausal years. And we're trying to address both the aerobic side of things and the, the weight and strengthening side of things as well. So the aerobic side of things is certainly going to be that uh, fat burner, it'll burn fat, it'll um, get up the sugars, the glucose. So that's great and that'll be a quick result if you are doing enough cardio work. And then by contrast, we have to, have to, have to do the strength work as well. So if we look um, the, the the sports medicine guidelines or the American, we take a lot of our guidelines from the, um, the American College of Sports Medicine. If we look at those guidelines, the basics that we have to do cardio wise are 150 minutes per week if you're doing moderate uh, intensity exercise or if you're doing a higher intensity or more vigorous exercise that would be about 75 minutes so the 75 minutes for example would be over three days three separate days whereas the 150 minutes could be over the course of the week and that's the walking gardening um, housework that type of thing so if we go into the more vigorous exercise then we're really working harder but less time so that's what you need to be doing on the cardio side of things. And then on the strength training side of things, you must, when you go into menopause, be doing the strength training. And if you're not, you really have to take a hard look at what you're doing. And of course, it's primarily for bone health, um, but it's for muscle mass, it's uh, our metabolic rate, and it's all the other reasons that I talked about there. So we have to be doing two separate days in the week. So you can't be doing the two days back to back. You have to be addressing uh, between eight and 10 muscle groups. And then you should be doing somewhere between 10 and 15 reps for each of those muscle groups. And you must be doing what is uh, 60, or 60 to 75% of what is your one repetition maximum. That's how much, you, how much weight you can lift with just one repetition. So 60 to 75% of that. And you have to be taking a hard look at whether you're doing that. And you really must, when you go into menopause, you must, must do your, your strength as well as your cardio. That's great, Maeve. And, and we hear a lot about osteoporosis uh, during the menopause. And what type of exercise do you think is best to sort of combat the effects of that? So we need to really think of the effect of our strength training on our bones. And bone remodeling is that, is what happens all the time throughout our life. And coming up to and in menopause, and uh, Quiva said this already, that we will already one to three years before your last period, you'll already be losing bone at the rate of 2% per year. So by the time you got, have got to your last period, you're going to have lost probably 6% and then 10 or 12% over those menopausal years and up as far as 30% is uh, for women who are around the age of 80. So all of that should be um, very motivating to people to say, okay, why do I do strength training then? And the strength training really affects that bro bone uh, modeling. So we've got bone broken down, bone being uh, built up, but Oestrogen plays a role in all of that, and there are receptors, and, um, and, and a lot of that oestrogen will affect the sensitivity within the muscles or within the bones. So what we need is a pull on the bone, pull, push, 
uh, strain signaling to that bone to really help with that remodeling and to build bone. So this means that effort is really important. So the more effort and the more you really challenge the bones with muscle and with pushing and pulling and getting that signaling and, and it has to be um, multi-directional. So for example, if you go out for a walk, um, you're not really going to be doing too much actually unless you do brisk walking and if you do brisk walking you're going to get at the, um, the, the neck of the femur, that femoral bone, but you're not going to get at the other muscles through the body. So you have to be doing, if you were doing walking it would be brisk walking or it would be uh, Nordic walking. Um, running, is, there's going to be more impact with that. So this is our, um, our, our impact sports. Uh, swimming isn't actually going to be doing that much for you. And, uh, and some of the elliptical things in the gym, they won't be either. So impact is really important. With the strength training, we've said already what that should be, but really challenging. It must be progressive loading. If you stick at the same weight and keep doing that, that actually becomes cardiovascular and it's not loading anymore. And then really important is flexibility. And the flexibility, the stretch um, and uh, yoga is going to be really good for this as well. And we need that for our activities of daily living to functionally be able to bend, to stay safe when we're doing all of that. So we're not injuring weak muscles, weak bones. And then finally balance. And uh, balance is, is, a, is an important one. And of course, that's prevention of falls and all the, um, the catastrophic effects um, of falls later in life. That's great, thank you. So we had a lot of questions from the audience about the use of hormone replacement therapy, HRT, um, in terms of managing the menopause symptoms. So, so Kiva, I thought, I'd ask you really some of the most common questions we've had from the audience. So let's start with HRT and the evidence that it actually works. That's a big question. <laughs> so HRT is hormone replacement therapy and, um, and it's been around actually since the 1940s. It's been around a really long time, um, but didn't really take off until the 60s and then became really commonly prescribed. Actually, Premarin, which is um, uh, a form of oestrogen, a tablet form of oestrogen was probably the most commonly prescribed medicine in the States in the early 90s. Um, so it was really popular. Um, and then we had the Women's Health Initiative, which was a very big study that happened in, uh, they started in 1991 and they published their results in the early 2000s, in 2002. And it, it was the original study that had drawn a line between um, breast cancer and, and hormone replacement therapy. And then we, uh, we saw a reduction in HRT prescribing over the next few years of about 60%. So women everywhere being taken off their hormone therapy and sort of panic happening everywhere. Um, much to the detriment actually probably of long-term health of lots of women, but anyway. Um, so that's what hormone therapy is. So it's, we're trying to, uh, the, the replacement part of it is actually a bit, of, is a bit misleading. We're not really totally replacing hormones that you've lost. Um, but we are trying to give back some of what has been lost from that ovarian production of hormones. Um, and for most women, uh, HRT is a combination of two hormones, estrogen and, and a progestogen. The estrogen component is there for all the health benefits um, that we've discussed. It's very good for bone health, it's good for cardiovascular health, um, and it is very good for symptom control. So its main purpose, I suppose, primarily is to help women who are suffering with hot flushes or night sweats or all those other symptoms that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and we have a huge body of evidence about how effective estrogen is, and it is probably the most effective treatment we have for things like hot flushes and night sweats. Um, and you can take it in a variety of ways. So you can take dermal estrogen, which is through your skin, and there is oral estrogen, which is the tablet form. Um, and there are differences in risk between those two. And then the second hormone, progestogen, its job is to keep your womb safe. So oestrogen has quite a stimulating effect in the lining of, of your womb. So if you're taking oestrogen and you have not had a hysterectomy, you still have a womb intact, the lining of your womb will thicken and that can lead ultimately to problems with bleeding, but I suppose more importantly, problems with abnormal cells and a risk of womb cancer. 
So we, we avoid that by using this other hormone, progestogen. And again, a variety of ways that you can take that progestogen. So that is the kind of standard hormone therapy, a combination of these two hormones. Women who've had a hysterectomy, they take estrogen on its own. So the Women's Health Initiative, which was um, the really big study, hundreds of thousands of women enrolled in it. And they set out to establish if estrogen was beneficial for cardiovascular disease. So if they had kind of for many, many years known um, and observed that as women lost estrogen, regardless of what age they were when their estrogen um, was, was gone or taken away or was no longer being produced, their cardiovascular risk started to rise. And so the theory was if we give these women estrogen, we will see a reduction in cardiovascular disease. And that's what they set out to prove. And that's really important because the study was not designed to look at breast cancer and HRT's impact on that. And the other flaw of the Women's Health Initiative was that the average age of woman was 63, which is a different age group generally to who we would be kind of initiating HRT for, typically speaking, which would be women in their early 50s, generally speaking. But it did show several things. So it showed that the uh, reduction in bone loss was really significant. Um, there have been studies since that have looked at dermal estrogen in particular and their effect in cardiovascular disease. And we know that there's a, a small reduction in the development of heart disease in women who've taken estrogen. Um, and in terms of breast cancer, I suppose that's a whole other discussion in itself. Um, and there is an impact of hormone therapy on breast cancer risk. And some of that information we have from the Women's Health Initiative, but there have been plenty of other studies since. Um, one of the confusing and sort of challenging things about HRT is when we say HRT, it's actually a catch-all term for lots of different types of medication, but they carry different risk. So we know that um, these body identical hormones are likely to carry less risk when it comes to breast cancer when compared to the type of HRT that was used uh, many years ago in the Women's Health Initiative that your grandmother or your, even your mum might have been prescribed. That's great, Kivas. So you've talked a lot about the benefits of HRT and you've touched on some of the risks, but do you, do you want to highlight you know, what the key risks are that we may want to consider in particular groups of women, for, for example? Well, I suppose the risk that most people think of is breast cancer. So it's probably uh, most important to talk about that first. Um, the more uh, recent studies we have that look at things like body identical hormones or some of the safer forms of HRT that we have, um, would suggest that there's certainly lower risk of breast cancer with these. And what they have shown would be that if you were kind of putting numbers or shape on that risk, we would see about four to five extra breast cancers out of a thousand women after somewhere between five to seven years of using HRT. I think it's really important to highlight that that degree of risk is quite similar to um, a lot of lifestyle choices that people make. Drinking a bottle, bottle and a half of wine a week, we'll also see about four to eight extra breast cancers out of a thousand women who do that for five years. Um, even the impact of exercise and smoking and um, body mass index and lots of other lifestyle choices we make, they impact our breast cancer risk too, and in quite a similar degree. So it's about putting risk into perspective, I think. Uh, you'll hear talk about um, a risk of um, blood clotting and HRT, um, when in fact we now know that actually a lot of the blood clot risk comes from using oral or tablet form of estrogen in particular. So the tablet form of estrogen, it's metabolized and broken down by your liver. And one of the knock-on impacts of that is that we see an increase in clotting factors, a particular protein that your liver makes. Uh, we don't see this happen with the more modern forms of oestrogen, which are often prescribed as a patch or a gel or a spray, and so they're metabolised through your skin. So very different risk. That's great, Kiva. And what are some of the non-hormonal alternatives to HRT? Yeah, I think I like to break it down for, for women that, I'm, um, that I meet on a daily basis. We talk about what are their different options for managing their particular set of symptoms that they might have and their priorities. Um, I think it's useful to look at lifestyle interventions. So we talk about things like cognitive behavioral therapy and, and different psychological interventions that can be really helpful for managing um, a lot of mood symptoms, anxiety, and just the psychological impact of this hormonal change. Um, 
Other lifestyle interventions, it's often opportunistic to talk about things like vitamin D and calcium intake and exercise, as Maeve has discussed as well, um, and the impact that might have for long-term health outcomes, but for symptom control too. Um, and everything else I think can really be broken down into either non-hormonal medications or HRT. The non-hormonal medications, we have several at our disposal that are useful for, in particular, treating hot flushes and night sweats or what are called vasomotor symptoms. Um, we sometimes use antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications. There's a bladder medication, there's a blood pressure medication, there's a few different types of medications that have been shown to be helpful for controlling night sweats and hot flushes in particular. Um, the knock-on effect often is that as someone's sleep might improve. And as a consequence, their mood improves, their productivity, their energy levels. So they are useful medications when used in the right person in the right way. That's great. Um, now, we've heard a lot about oestrogen, progesterone, but what about testosterone and, and uh, you know, its role in the menopause or as a hormone replacement therapy? Yes testosterone uh, so testosterone has somehow uh, like exploded in popularity <laughs> in the last year or two and i feel now I, I get asked about this all the time yeah so but it is a really interesting hormone it's the third hormone that your ovaries produce um and i think we think of it so much as being a male hormone which it is so men make about 10 times the amount of hormone or t 10 times the amount of testosterone that we make but we make about three times the amount of testosterone than we do estrogen um, we use that testosterone for lots of things. We actually make some of our estrogen from our testosterone. So we convert it into estrogen. Um, but it's a really important hormone for um, several different reasons. Um, it's important for muscle and bone strength, cognitive function, um, maybe mood, maybe energy, and definitely important for sexual function and libido. Um, the best data and research we have actually looks at using testosterone replacement or giving someone testosterone on prescription for managing symptoms of low sexual desire or low sexual satisfaction or low libido. Um, the other, I think, interesting thing about testosterone is we don't lose it the same way that we lose estrogen. So you can see this fairly significant fall and decline in estrogen levels over a few years span between sort of late perimenopause and, and early menopause. But testosterone we lose at a much slower, more gradual decline from our mid to late 30s into our 60s. And actually there was a recent Australian study that showed our testosterone levels go back up in our 70s and nobody knows why. But it's a useful hormone certainly for sexual function in particular, yeah. That's, that's great. So, so when should we start HRT and should we start it in the perimenopause? And how long should we be on HRT for? That's a big question. It is indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where the replace the R for replacement in HRT is a bit misleading because we do actually use it in perimenopause. Um, so if you go back to when we were discussing about how perimenopause is really, it's volatile, it's a bit of a roller coaster, and at times you're overproducing estrogen and at times you're underproducing. And it's a bit counterintuitive to tell someone, I think a lot of your symptoms are happening because you've too much estrogen on board and I'm going to prescribe you some estrogen. And people look at you a bit funny, but the underlying kind of rationale behind that is the reason that your ovaries are producing too much at times and the reason that there's so much volatility is because your brain is trying to stimulate them. It's trying to get the car back between the ditches, so to speak. And if you can give someone a safety net, so if you give them some estrogen so that they never dip below a certain level, their brain ceases that stimulation. It's like their brain backs off a little. And as a consequence, their ovaries calm down and we get sort of hormonal stability returning and symptoms improve. Those PMS type symptoms that people get through perimenopause often improve. So that's where it can be used in perimenopause. So I think, again, it comes back to quality of life, how much these symptoms are impacting you. And if you feel there's an issue and you're concerned, chat to someone like myself or your GP or whoever it might be and talk about, you know, HRT is one option to treat these symptoms in perimenopause. That, that's great. And, and we had an interesting question um, about the use of HRT um, when a, a, their mother had had uh, breast cancer. I mean, you've touched on that. Do you, do you want to elaborate whether you feel that's important? It is important, I think, because breast cancer is really, really, really common. So uh, about one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Like it's a lot more common than I think we even want to accept. Um, and but because of that, a lot of women I speak to have a family history of breast cancer. So if you have a first degree relative who has breast cancer, potentially your risk is approximately doubled. Um, if you have two second degree relatives, 
your risk is uh, approximately tripled. Um, the background risk for someone bet between the age of about 50 and 55 for breast cancer, to develop breast cancer over the next five years, so in that time frame from 50 to 55, is about 1.4%. That's the background risk. So you're still dealing with small, absolute risk. But having a family history of breast cancer is extremely common. So it's important to know, well, what's the impact of HRT on that risk? Because the impact of HRT is small on breast cancer risk in general, that's still true for women who have a family history. The impact on their risk is the same as it is for anybody else, but they are potentially starting a little higher on that ladder of risk. Their baseline risk, their starting point is a little bit higher and that has to be taken into consideration. So really important that we counsel women properly, really important that we look at the benefits of HRT. They often offset some of that risk um, and really important what we prescribe as we you know, kind of said earlier, a lot of progestogens or certain hormones will carry different risk than others. It's important to use breast friendly hormones and HRT when we're prescribing. So Maeve, does taking HRT improve our sexual health as well? So taking HRT uh, will certainly improve aspects of it. So the, the aspect of it, so vaginal lubrication can be a huge problem in menopause um, and perimenopause and certainly later in life as well. And the vagina will always benefit from some vaginal estrogen. So that has to be discussed with the, the GP. And the, in parallel to using vaginal estrogen, the other things that are going to help it, and I'm a physiotherapist, of course, I'm going to say it, but it's pelvic floor exercise. And this is because um, sexual health and sexual satisfaction is not just one thing. It's not just how your vagina feels. It's, it's, it's about so many other different things. So taking some control of um, your sex life, and part of that is improving pelvic floor um, contract contraction, which has been shown to improve. So strength has been shown to improve sexual health. But also along with the vaginal estrogen, there's um, pelvic floor relaxation capacity. So if the vaginal muscles, if everything's a little bit tight, it's a little bit sore, as it can easily be with vaginal atrophy, then certainly taking the estrogen, but also working on the pelvic floor to relax or release muscles that have become tight. And then, of course, after that, there's so many other, there's libido with testosterone um, as a possibility, as Quiva has talked about. And then Maria might have a whole, um, a whole other area to talk about with the psychosexual side of things as well, which is, of course, massive. That's great. And you touched on earlier about exercise in terms of improving bone health. What about HRT for bone health? So HRT, if you have to look at you know, HRT or exercise, and if I was to do, okay, you can have one or you can have the other to keep your bones healthy, HRT is, is going to be more beneficial. And, uh, and exercise, if you can't take HRT, as many women can't or don't want to, well, then exercise will go a long way to make up for the estrogen deficiency in the body. The ideal HRT and exercise together. Brilliant. And Maria, moving over to you in terms of sleep disturbances and insomnia caused by the perimenopause and menopause, how will HRT help in that respect? And how can we help to sleep better during the perimenopause? Well, sleep is a really important factor. Um, it's really one of the key pillars for our health, both for our mental health and our physical health. Um, so it's really important to address that, um, whether you're going through the menopause um, or not. Um, when we experience sleep disturbance, it affects everything really. It affects our uh, cognitive functioning, it affects our mood. So if we're experiencing anxiety and depression and disturbed sleep, it can really exacerbate that. So it's really important to try and um, improve sleep and set some kind of, put some key strategies in place to try and um, improve our sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is really about putting us in the best possible position for a good night's sleep. And there's lots of different things that we can do to improve that. Um, I would say the first key thing to do is consistency. So um, if you have a good um, bedtime routine and you're really consistent about that, that really functions as a kind of an anchor for a good sleeping pattern. So that means going to bed at the same time every night getting up at the same time every day, whether it's the weekday or the weekend. So 
that is pretty much the single best thing that everyone can do for their sleep. Um, it's a really hard thing to do, especially at the weekends when, when you want to lie in, but it makes such a huge difference. So a lot of people have an alarm for getting up in the morning, but actually I think it's a great idea to also set an alarm for going to bed at night. And through doing that, you kind of minimize the temptation of staying up later. And um, especially if you know that you're having trouble sleeping, it can be tempting to stay up really late and, you know, kind of avoiding it to, uh, to, to some extent. But it's really important to be really consistent about that. And the second thing is to avoid um, alcohol and caffeine and drugs like marijuana as well, um, because they can really impact on our sleep. Um, so even though some people may feel that alcohol helps them actually to get to sleep, but it's a sedative. So the sleep that you have when you have alcohol in your system actually doesn't give you the same physiological benefits that normal sleep would. So better to try and avoid those substances or minimize them at least um, in the hours before sleep um, because it can really affect um, how beneficial sleep is for us. Um, thirdly then, um, it's really important to think about how stress impacts on our sleep as well. So um, we can lie awake at night kind of um, thinking about, um, you know, the different worries we have going on um, at the moment and that can kind of keep us awake, keep us awake at night. Um, so we can't always change the stressors that we're experiencing, but we can certainly minimize the impact that stress has on our sleep. So um, one way of doing that is to try and proactively manage stressors during the day, um, even writing them down, talking about them with other people, having a plan in place and to do that earlier on in the day. So it's not the last thing that we think about at night. It's also really important to try and stop working or doing stimulating tasks in the 90 minutes before you're going to sleep. So that is a time to kind of start unwinding, have, have a wind down routine um, for the hour before you go to bed. So uh, there's a reason that when we have young children, you know, you have a bedtime routine, you stick to it and in the hope that that will um, help um, our children to sleep. And it's no different for us as well. Our bodies need some time to kind of um, wind down and relax at the end of the day and that can set us up for a good night's sleep. So find something that works for you and try and stick to it and be really consistent with that. So another really important point for sleep is to ditch the devices. So we have a tendency to spend time on our phones or our computers and tablets, um, especially it can be really tempting to lie in bed and check our messages, um, but actually that's the worst thing you can do. So there's a lot of consistent research now at this point highlighting how damaging blue light can be on our sleep. Um, it really um, is a signal to our bodies to wake up and it can dysregulate our, our, our body's natural sleep-wake cycle. So try and minimise your exposure to blue light, especially coming up to your bedtime. So the hour before bed, try not to look at your phone, keep it outside your room if you can, um, try not to work um, and um, yeah, try to, to minimise watching TV before bed as well. So really um, try and dim the lights, you can you know, use um, apps to try and um, that kind of dim the lights on your devices as well in line with your time zone uh, to minimise blue light exposure or you can dim the lights in your house or even turn them off, um, use amber lights or even amber tinted glasses, that can help as well. So try and minimise that exposure to light late in the day. And exposure to light early in the day when you wake up is, is really beneficial. So. Um, for women who are, so I suppose there's lots of different um, ways in which sleep can be disrup disrupted for women who are experiencing uh, menopause. So some people find it difficult to get to sleep, other people uh, wake up a lot during the night and can't get back to sleep and for others they might wake up very early and then not be able to get back to sleep after that. And if you are waking up very early and struggling to get back to sleep, it's really important not to expose yourself to light because that is a signal for your body to wake up again. So even if you wake up earlier in the night, uh, don't turn on the light until your ideal wake up time. Try and um, stay in the dark. So it's really useful to have blackout blinds or blackout curtains that can really help because our body needs the dark to sleep. It's a, a sleep signal for us, so it's really important. 
And then a final point as well, um, as Quiva was saying, a lot of women experience these night sweats or um, you know, hot flushes, and that can be really disruptive for sleep as well. So a common strategy that people use there would be, say, to have a, a washcloth or some cold water available to you during the night, and you can use that to try and help um, cool your body down during the night. And again, avoid getting up if you can, um, but just have that available so that, uh, so that you can use it if you need it. That's great, some really useful advice, Maria. Moving on to depression, we hear a lot about women uh, going mm. through the menopause, feeling depressed and you know we have a question here, are you more likely to get depressed if you had postnatal depression? Postnatal, okay. Um, well the research would suggest that depression is more likely during the perimenopause stage rather than um, during the menopause, so your, your risk of depression might lower again during the menopause itself. Um, but there is a 30% increased risk of experiencing depressive symptoms during this transition. And women who have a history of depression are um, at a five times greater risk again. So uh, it does increase the risk. But if you have a history of depression, to be forewarned is kind of to be forearmed. So I if you know this, um, then it's really important to make sure that you have the supports in place, uh, say in terms of social supports, and um, in terms of access to mental health facilities as well, or me mental health care. Um, so just to make sure that if you do experience those symptoms, that um, you have those supports in place to help you to manage those. So, so Kiva, we hear a lot about issues with brain fog, you know, lack of concentration, mood swings, etc. So do you have any strategies that um, can help with dealing with that in perimenopausal or postmenopausal women? I think it can be very challenging. I think acknowledging it is probably the first hurdle to cross, knowing how common it is, and that a good 80% of women probably experience some issue with their cognitive function, their memory, their verbal fluency, uh, those kind of symptoms as they move through menopause. Normalizing it, I think, will really help as well. Um, I, I, you know, I talk to a lot of women and, they're, and they would describe the impact that these symptoms have on their, on their daily life and their ability to work and function and be productive. There's a huge impact on confidence. Like your self-esteem, your confidence is massively affected by being self-conscious about the fact that you might find it hard to find the right word or to concentrate, to learn a new task in work. Um, that fear of, I suppose, like public speaking and that you'll be talking and lose your train of thought, which happens us all. But um, I think that's a symptom that's often exaggerated through perimenopause. Um, verbal fluency is a really, um, really common um, co complaint or issue for a lot of women. Um, there's biology behind it as well. It's not, um, it's not a sort of, you know, in your head type symptom. Um, there's been quite a bit of research in the States looking at the neuroscience behind this. Uh, we know oestrogen is actually a hugely impactful hormone for your brain um, and your brain doesn't much appreciate the fluctuating levels that happen through perimenopause and as a consequence we see changes in brain metabolism and energy production in, in your brain. You can actually see differences in PET scans so if you image someone's brain um, if they're perimenopausal, if, you're, if, if you know they're having fluctuating estradiol levels, if you compare that actually to, if you take a woman in her 30s and you look at her brain, if she's perimenopausal at that age, and you compare her to someone who's perimenopausal or menopausal in their 50s, you'll have very similar outcomes when you image their brain. So it's independent of age. This is not an aging process that's happening women, it's a truly hormonal effect. Um, so I think acknowledging that, recognizing it, normalizing it, taking away some of that fear. I think a lot of women are terrified that this is the beginning of dementia, that this is aging and they're never going to get this, you know, that feeling of being sharp back again. Um, one other strategy that's kind of helpful is to minimize some of the other compounding factors. There's a big association, um, and again, another American study would have demonstrated there's a huge association between hot flushes and night sweats, so our vasomotor symptoms, and worsening cognitive function. So women who get worse hot flushes tend to experience more of these um, brain fog type symptoms, and often treating the underlying vasomotor symptoms um, often translates to an improvement in sleep and therefore an improvement in cognitive function. Um, 
There's other strategies too, I'm sure, you know, and cognitive behavioral therapy probably has a role here too. Um, but often estrogen replacement is really the answer and has a huge role to play in terms of helping women cope with these symptoms, yeah. That's great, thank you, Kiva. So, so moving back to Maeve then, you've mentioned this uh, previously in terms of the benefits of, of, of pelvic floor exercise during mm. the menopause, but do you just want to tell us a little bit more about, about yeah. that? It really addresses so much to do with our pelvic floor and so much happens with our pelvic floor as we go into menopause. If you exercise the pelvic floor, technically or physiologically, what will happen is there'll be an improvement in blood flow through the muscles. The muscles will develop in that they'll start firing more so there'll be a better neural drive. That will help with symptoms of bladder urgency um, and uh, bladder frequency, uh, urge incontinence, which is the leaking when you can't get, quite get to the, the toilet, um, or it happens at the hall door, and leaking with cough or sneeze. And then we would have that same help with bowel control, anybody who has leakage of stool or bowel urgency. And then it helps too with constipation because you've got uh, the whole relaxation capacity as well and then pelvic organ prolapse so if if um, the, the bladder wall or if the, the rectal wall if anything or the uterus if anything is coming down pelvic floor exercise will help there too and um, and finally as we mentioned there as well sexual health so and with the sexual health aspect of it we we do get in the same way we get an improvement in the pelvic floor muscles with vaginal estrogen we will get an improvement in the elasticity and blood flow through the muscles with pelvic floor exercise as well so it's win-win doing your pelvic floor exercises and how long do we need to do these pelvic floor exercises for and you know what's the time frame in terms yeah. of the benefits so the, I suppose I should say um, how many times a day first and then over what period of time. So the exercises should be done at probably 60 repetitions every day. Um, you'd get away with 10 repetitions three times a day. Um, but you should really do 20 repetitions three times a day. And if you were really doing your homework well, you'd be doing 30 repetitions three times a day. And they're mixed between endurance exercises, how long can you hold on for 10 seconds, maybe 10 repetitions of that. Can you do fast contractions? Can you lift all the way up, all the way down? There's a this thing with pelvic floor exercise that's really useful. It's a, an elevator analogy. You, you lift up, you squeeze up to the sixth floor. That full relaxation is down to the basement. It's not just down to the second floor. So if you can't feel your muscles squeezing and letting go, well, then you're not squeezing and letting go properly. You're, you're operating between the second and the fourth floor on the elevator and you need a little bit of help trying to figure out how to get to the top and figure out how to get down to the bottom. So if the muscles are working, if you're doing your exercises correctly and if the muscles are working correctly, then over a period of a few months, you'll see a benefit. And some of the guidelines tell us, and this is on our NICE guidelines, say we have to do at least three months of pelvic floor muscle training to get an effect. But sometimes if you change that neural drive of the muscles, it'll actually happen sooner than that because you've just told the muscles what to do. And equally, if the muscles aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and it takes a few months to get there, so it takes you even three months or six months to start doing it correctly, well, then we have a training effect that goes even further than that. So I haven't been that helpful in my answer anywhere between immediately and a year. That's great, that's great, Maeve. So moving on to sort of life beyond the menopause, Maeve. Um, we have a question here about maintaining a healthy weight beyond the menopause and a, a specific question on, do we really have to reduce the calorie intake to maintain a healthy weight? So the, um, and of course this is, this is one, if we, if we did a dietitian here, we'd be asking the dietitian. So I want to remember I'm a physiotherapist and not be, not be answering. However, I do kind of know the answer to that really because it uh, comes into exercise as well in terms of what we do. If you do the same amount of exercise going into menopause that you were doing before and without changing anything, um, you're probably going to put on weight and our, uh, our metabolic rate changes so we're, it's a little bit more of a challenge so we're going to have more fat laid down and we have the, some of the statistically we, we might develop over a period of three years and this is a little bit scary but maybe two centimeters around the waist two and a half kilos 
about over that same period of time of three years. So, and 10 kilos is, is a figure that I've heard over the, the, the course of you know, that whole transition. So that's really huge. So if you want to lose weight, you have to be doing more than you were doing, really challenging your, um, your metabolic rate. So that's going to be the cardio stuff we talked about, and that's going to be the really developing muscle bulk as well, which is really important for your metabolic rate. But when you do all of that, if you want to lose that weight, you do have to be coming down by about 500 calories per day, as well as upping your exercise. So that's kind of going to do it for you. Significant amount of calories to lose. <laughs> Okay, Maeve, in terms of stiff joints, stiff knees, you mm. know, we hear a lot of complaints in that regard. Um, is there anything yeah. we can do about that? Yeah. Is that a common complaint during yeah, menopause? Yeah, it is. It is common. I mean, certainly estrogen does affect our cartilage and our collagen and, and our tendons and our muscles. I mean, it, it affects everything. But we are going to have a little bit more natural inflammation there because cartilage is kind of protecting bone on bone so and if estrogen was helpful in that well we're not going to have as much protection so if you put that together with muscles that are weaker that aren't being trained enough and maybe becoming a little bit more sedentary um, it, there's a, um, a, a statistic that says after menopause we, we become more sedentary by 40 percent so if you have all of those factors then and, and maybe that little bit more weight on top of it as well. Um, not exercising enough, you are going to get painful joints. But yes, we can blame oestrogen in the first place, but there's a lot of other factors uh, there too. That's, that's great, thank you. So we've heard a lot about the negatives of the menopause and how to deal with them. So we need to think about the positives, Maria. So what are some mm. of the positives <laughs> of the menopause? There is always a tendency to focus <laughs> on the negatives, is there, isn't there? But I suppose, um, you know, the first thing to say is that for not everyone who experiences menopause has symptoms. So some people don't even realize that they're going through the menopause. So that's a positive in itself. For women who do experience symptoms, there are also some very clear um, and obvious um, benefits as well. So some positives of it. Um, the first being that you no longer have periods. So that will come as a relief, as some relief, I suppose, to women who, especially those who experience heavy periods or painful periods as well. So that, that is a plus. Um, you also no longer have to worry about contraception. Um, so that's no longer an issue. And then finally, I would say as well that it's a really good opportunity to actually just um, reflect and just think about how resilient your body is and what it has gone through, all of the various challenges and changes throughout life um, and what it has withstood. Um, so it, it's kind of amazing in that way. So yes, it, it is a time of change, but it's also that kind of opportunity for reflection as well. So um, I suppose the research would suggest that um, women in their early 50s tend to experience um, or tend to report lower rates of happiness um, so that there is a bit of decline there. But then actually from the mid 50s right through to our 70s, um, there's an increase in, in reported happiness there. And that's often linked with um, a reduction in caregiving responsibilities or a reduction in work stress as well. Um, so there are very positives to that um, stage in life as well. Um, so I think viewing it as an opportunity um, for change um, and uh, the kind of the start of a new uh, of a new stage in life and thinking about well what do you want this stage to look at um, what do you want um, your life to be like and what opportunities are there for you so I think um, it's a kind of an, an instigator for that um, to, to do that reflection at that point. Thanks Maria. So Quiva what's your positive messages coming out of the menopause? So uh, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to maybe um, acknowledge how wonderful it is to hear positives. That's what we should be doing. A, a huge shift in attitude really needs to happen, I think. And if we're constantly telling women 
that this is a negative thing and that it's something um, that is associated with lots of negative symptoms. If that is constantly reinforced, it's no wonder that women will be um, scared of, embarrassed of, um, you know, sticking their heads in the sand about, like it's, it's gonna be something that women won't want to face because they're told it's a horrible experience and actually that's not the truth at all. Um, uh, there's lots of actually research globally that would suggest in cultures where where aging is more embraced and seen as a positive thing, a lot of menopausal symptoms are less significantly impactful and people suffer with menopausal symptoms less. So there's definitely, I think it's wrapped up in our, in our attitude to aging. Uh, that's not helpful anyway. So it's great to see these positives, I think. That's great. And Maeve, do you have any positive or hopeful messages? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of as Maria is saying there as well, it's, it's really seizing now the the, uh, the opportunity, this, this new place that you are and this new learning experience and, and taking everything that there is to learn from it. And some of that is, is exercise and some people haven't, you know, people come in, sometimes they come into menopause with them, um, with I suppose, you know, exercise um, in the bank, you know, and, and the whole weight control all, you know, in the bank and not in an overdraft. But some people come in in an overdraft and they really have to discover exercise and they do discover exercise and then they it, it's really nice and, and, and very empowering for the body to to understand what it is your body needs what it is you have to do and that goes for the pelvic floor exercise as well and then really feeling better and having discovered exercise feeling feeling better and really feeling the 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 good of it and the benefit of it that you never did feel before so you have to do it in the menopause and it uh, it can be fun right so we're coming to a close uh, in terms of this evening's discussion. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to ask each of you in turn what your key take home messages would be for the viewers watching. So first over to Kiva. My take home message, I think from my perspective, knowing that there's help there, knowing who to talk to, knowing that, um, you know, specifically, I suppose, with HRT and hormone therapy, that we have this wonderful opportunity to really in a positive way really impact women's quality of life and long-term health outcomes. You had asked me about evidence earlier and we talked about the Women's Health Initiative. One of the long-term follow-up um, outcomes of that study, and it's been around for a long time, was that if you look at all cause mortality. So if you just look at women's outcomes, factoring everything in, they lived longer, their quality of life is better. Um, HRT is not for everyone by all means, you know, there's women who will choose not to or cannot take it. But just knowing that it's there as an option, knowing what your other options are, are important too. So if you have, you know, if, you, if you're having symptoms, if you have concerns, make sure you talk to someone, reach out, be active. So Maria, key, key take home messages from you. Um, I think the first thing I would say is to just reiterate that it's a normal, healthy process. Um, you know, everyone goes through it um, and people, even if you experience psychological symptoms associated with it, most of the time they're transient. And it's really important to remember that um, it happens in midlife. So there's lots of other things going on as well and we can't blame the menopause on everything um, or for everything either. So, you know, there are other family stressors or financial stressors, other things, life is still going on in parallel. So um, it's really important to, to view it in context, I suppose. Um, so I think the key thing is to try and let go of the fear around it and let go of the fear of what um, um, is or may happen and as much as you can just accept it and embrace it and integrate it in your life. So um, like um, Maeve was saying as well, you know, to, to try and adopt those changes in a positive way and try and be more active and, and tackle it that way. That's great. And Maeve, you have the last word. The last word. Two things. Um, first one, to look after your muscle and bone health and understand the principles, know what it is you're supposed to do and do it and enjoy doing it and progressively load those muscles and bones, challenge them, look for changes in your body. And if you're not sure how to do it, then there are so many professionals out there that can help you and there's online too. So there really are, there are no excuses if you can move your body parts and if everything is uh, stacked on your side. So 
that's really important and I would just have really to have fun doing that I think that's so important and the second thing then is pelvic floor muscles of course I'm going to say that as a uh, women's health and menopause physiotherapist you have to do your pelvic floor exercises don't accept the things that might be going on or wrong with your pelvic floor. If you can't feel where your pelvic floor muscles are, don't give up on it. Go and get help, get that pelvic floor stronger and challenge and enjoy seeing the, the benefit of your pelvic floor and your pelvic health in the long term. So that concludes our session today. My thanks to speakers, Dr. Kiva Hartley, Dr. Maria Pertle and Maeve Whelan. I'd also like to reiterate my thanks to RCSI's uh, Women's Network and the My Health team for the collaboration on this event. The next event in the My Health series will focus on supporting your cardiovascular and heart health. Further details about this and other upcoming events in the RCSI My Health series can be found on the website. From all of us here at RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, thank you for watching.